thank you so much for having me come. Appreciate it very, very much the invitation. And uh, hope that uh, within the next hour and a half, you'll enjoy the things we talk about. And uh, I said that to discourage you. I'll <laughs> encourage you to be less than that. But uh, it's good to see you. Thank you for inviting me to come. I appreciate the Edwards. Appreciate them very, very much. And uh, appreciate getting to see them again. We've known Stephanie since way back, uh, way back before she was married. And uh, my wife and I were part of uh, Florida College camps, and uh, Miss Stephanie was uh, coming to that. And I uh, remember her way back then. But uh, she's grown up to be a fine young lady and a mother, and we appreciate her and her husband and her kids. Appreciate them very, very much. Appreciate getting to know all of you all as well and getting to meet you and appreciate uh, uh, you being here tonight. Uh, tonight, I want to talk to you a little bit about, about believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And knowing or expecting, not knowing, but expecting that most all of us that would be here tonight are Christians. Um, I still wanted to talk about this because I think it's very important for us to understand the um, importance of believing that Jesus is the Christ and the Son of God. Well, I think we're all familiar with this great text in John the 20th chapter and verses 30 and 31. The text reads, Many other signs, therefore Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Now I believe that John wrote this gospel, and I believe that when he refers to this book, he's talking about the gospel of John. But certainly we understand that the entirety of the New Testament, from Matthew to the book of Revelation, was written for an intent and purpose that we might read it and believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So tonight I want to talk to us a little bit about one of the great miracles that Jesus did and the reason he performed the miracle and that it is for us to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And we're going to discuss about the significance of believing Jesus Christ is the Son of God based upon that miracle that he performed. So if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to the book of Luke chapter 5. In Luke chapter 5, we'll use that as the basis of our study this evening. And we're going to look at verses 17 through 26. This is a familiar story, or should be a familiar story, to all of us. But if you're not a member of the body of Jesus Christ, and you're here, we're certainly glad and happy for your presence. And we'll certainly not try or purposely say anything to offend you or hurt your feelings. But we will try to look at God's Word and study it in such a way that we can glean from it the wisdom that God would have us to have, the knowledge He would have us to have, so that we can be obedient to God and have a hope in heaven. So, I'd like you to take your Bibles, study with us, and we're going to start by just reading the text, and we'll go back and look at it a little bit closer. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Version. And verse 17 begins by saying, And it came about one day that he was teaching, and there were some Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. And behold, some men were carrying a bed, on a bed, a man who was paralyzed. And they were trying to bring him in and to let him down in front of him. And not finding any way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down through the tiles with his stretcher right in the center in front of Jesus. And seeing their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But Jesus, aware of their reasoning, answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins have been forgiven you, or to say, Rise and walk. 
But in order that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise and take up your stretcher and go home. And at once he rose up before them and took up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. And they were all seized with astonishment and began glorifying God. And they were filled with fear, saying, We have seen remarkable things today. Now my guess is all of us have read this story. We've heard this story. And it is but one of many in the New Testament concerning a miracle that Jesus performed. Now, I will suggest to you that there are many of these miracles, and each of them ha have a point. There's a reason why Jesus performed the miracle. But when you put them all together, it's like John says in John 20, but these have been written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That's the ultimate end. But in this great story, there is something that is significant about him performing this miracle. Yes, believing he is the Son of God, but what can the Son of God do? So when we consider this story, they're in Capernaum. The text teaches us in verse 17 that about one, it came about one day from Mark chapter 2. There's a parallel account there, and there's also a parallel account in Matthew chapter 9. So what I'd like to do is just make sure that we gel those three stories together and come up with what happened that day. So it's at Capernaum, and he is teaching. Now, Capernaum is at the north of the Sea of Galilee, and it was an area that sometimes he referred to as his home. Capernaum is the village of Nahum. You've heard of Nahum in the Old Testament prophets. This, they believe, was his village. But we also understand that Jesus was there and he was teaching. And notice he says that he's talking to some of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, which sometimes are referred to as lawyers, or they are scribes. They are ones that teach the law. And notice that they are from all the varying villages round about in Galilee and Judea and even from Jerusalem. They know Jesus is there. They want to hear his teachings, so they come to listen to him. And you notice the text says that they are there, sitting there. Now, you may recall that Jesus talks about sitting in important places. Well, it's not our lesson tonight, but I will just suggest to us that you can imagine that these Pharisees and these scribes were sitting in a lofty position of authority and expecting to be honored and appreciated for who they were. But here's this Jesus of Nazareth. And he's there teaching, and he's instructing them. And it's important that we notice in this text, as he says, the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. Now, I think it's important that we notice maybe over in John, the 14th chapter, and in verse 10, there's a statement that the Lord made about this power. He says in verse 10 of John 14, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Now what is interesting about this is when you study the life of Jesus, you find how that there is a cohesiveness, there is a working together of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Notice Jesus says that the Father is in him. And he says, I am in the Father. And I do the works of my Father. I speak the words of my Father. Did you notice that? And in this Luke passage, it talks about that the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. Now, the New Testament expresses the divinity, the deity of Jesus in many different ways. Let me take you back just for a brief moment to demonstrate. In the book of Genesis, you remember the first verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
Remember that passage? Well, the word God that is there is a plural word. It is Elohim. We learn later in the text of Genesis 1, verse 26, let us make man in our image. Those are plural personal pronouns. Us, our. It shows not a plurality of gods, one God, but three divine beings. Now, that is a rather meaty topic to talk about. Why I'm bringing it up here Jesus demonstrates by performing this miracle that he's getting ready to perform that it's not just him doing this. He's doing this because he's doing the works of his Father. He is doing the works of the Holy Spirit. What he says in this text ultimately is, is that God is working with me and through me because we are God. You follow me? How is that important? Because he's not just going to pull a rabbit out of the hat and do some magical trick just to overwhelm or surprise the people. There's a point. God is among them. God is among them. So, the text goes on to say in verse 18, And behold, some men were carrying on a bed a man who was paralyzed. And they were trying to bring him in and to set him down in front of him. Now, you can imagine this great crowd of people. I don't know what kind of building or room or uh, house they were in, but it talks about, in the New American Standard, there being piles in the roof. It's some kind of roofing that where they could take it apart, and they did tear it apart. But there is such a crowd of people that they can't get the man in to Jesus. All right? Now the text goes on to say, and not finding any way to bring him in, because of the crowd, they went on the roof and let him down through the tiles with his stretcher right in the center in front of Jesus. Now, that had to be a, a great scene, did it not? Can, can you imagine that for whatever reasons, um, you're, you're there and you are lucky enough to be inside the house. And the Lord is right here. And you're, you're waiting to listen to him and to hear a word or a message from him. And all of a sudden, you start hearing this uh, noise, and all of a sudden, some stuff is falling down from the ceiling. And all of a sudden, the ceiling opens up, and, and it keeps getting bigger. And you see these guys up there, and you're thinking, what, don't you think maybe the teaching and or the listening kind of came to a halt? Don't you maybe everybody kind of thought, well, what in the world? What are these guys trying to do? Now, in order for it to be a stretcher or a bed, uh, for a man to lay upon it, they had to, they had to build a pretty big hole. Now you look up there, that light up there. That wouldn't be big enough to put a man through that, would it? On a stretcher. So they had to build a pretty big hole. Didn't they? So they kept carrying this. Now, I don't know who the man or the person was that owned this house, but my guess is if they're there present, they're thinking, these folks are tearing my house up. They're tearing my house up. But they're tearing it up, and they lift, they let this man down, on this stretcher. Now, people see this man on this stretcher, everybody knows, oh, now I get it. Now I know what they're trying to do, right? They want Jesus to do this. So they drop him down, and here's a photo of the actual scene. <laughs> it's preserved <laughs> through National Geographic. He's let down, and the text says, right in front of Jesus. So whether or not Jesus was interested in paying any attention to this fellow, he's right in front of him. He has to pay attention to him now because he's right there. Right? Notice the text. He says, verse 20, and seeing their faith. Notice the plurality. Their faith. Would that not include the paralytic? Yeah. But would it not include the four men we find in the book of Mark, there are four of them, that they go to all of this effort and all of this work in order to get this man in front of Jesus. What were they thinking? What did they have faith in? Obviously they had heard of Jesus. 
Jesus. How does faith come? By hearing, right? By hearing. So they heard about this guy, right? Maybe they've seen him. I don't know. But they have the faith to cut out this hole in the roof and to go through the effort of letting this man down. Jesus sees that. Notice the text. He says, friend. Now, in the other account, it says, take courage, my son. So while there is great faith on the part of the four men who let him down, Jesus speaks directly to the fellow that's paralytic. Jesus understood what it was all about, what was going on. He understood it. But the text goes on to say to us, friend, your sins are forgiven you. Now I don't know, but my guess is, since the fellow was a paralytic, and they let him down in front of Jesus, that is not what they were expecting to hear. Now, I'm not, I'm not belittling the fact that his sins were going to be forgiven as insignificant. That was a great, big deal. But that's not why they were there. They were there for him to be healed, right? Isn't God interesting sometimes? We seek God for one thing and then He gives us something else. And at the moment we're thinking, um, what? what? Why did He do that? Well, we can read in the scriptures where my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways. Isaiah talked about God knows what's best. And what is the absolute bestest, greatest, most wonderfulest thing that God could ever do for you. For me. Just forgive your sins. So Jesus said, friend, my son, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees, now you know they're going to erupt. They're going to react by the fact that this man says your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisees began to reason, saying, now, in Matthew's account, it says, in themselves, to themselves. And we would say, they funky. <laughs> they were thinking, right? But Jesus demonstrates his power as the Son of God by responding to what they thought. Now, my wife and I have been married for almost 100 years. <laughs> and it has become really eerie. We'll go on a trip somewhere and for for miles and miles and miles and miles and miles. Not a word said. Not a word said. And then just like, I don't know, like on a cue or something, we will both speak up at about the same time and it's on the same topic. That's scary. That's weird. Well, you know, they they say the longer you live with each other, the more you be well, I can't explain it. I'm going to suggest to you something. Look at this text. Jesus knew the reasoning of themselves. And he says, verse 21, Who is this man who speaks blasphemies? What's blasphemy? Well, basically it means to speak against. But the Jews used it, and the whole Paul used it, to when a man would speak blasphemous, if he made himself out to be God, or something more than a man. Well, the text goes on to say, who can forgive sins but God alone? What is the answer? Who can forgive sins? I remember the book of Matthew, chapter 9, that his apostles asked Jesus one time, Who then gave you sin? Jesus responded with the man, This is impossible. God can call this. So the Jews weren't wrong on it. They heard Jesus say, Your sins are forgiven, and they're wondering, Well, why is he blaspheming? Who can forgive sins but God? That's a great question. But they're thinking that. 
So Jesus reveals what they're thinking and he shows them his divinity. Because who knows what another person is really thinking? Well, verse 22 says, But Jesus, aware of their reasoning, their thinking, answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Now, if I was to come up to this fellow sitting right here, what was your name? Right. Now, he's been sitting there, he's been looking at me as I've been teaching. Now, if I was to say to him, Now, what have you been thinking about that ice cream you're going to get out of church? <laughs> And the thing that is, if he was really thinking about getting ice cream after church, he'd be saying, how did you know what I was thinking? Well, I don't even know if he likes ice cream. I don't even know if he's thinking that. So if I said that and I happened to be right, that would just be a quick day. Because I can't read his mind. But you see the point? Here in the situation, Jesus responds by saying, why are you reasoning in your hearts? He goes on to say, which is easier to say, your sins have been forgiven you, or to say, rise and walk? They had to have known he knows what I'm thinking. They had to have known that. That had to be a little That had to cause just a little bit of a chill factor to come over them, right? <coughs> How would you answer that question? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise and walk? What would you vote on that? I would vote it's easier to say your sins are forgiven. Why? Because you can't prove that. But if you say, rise and walk, the proof is in the fellow getting up. So Jesus asks them, which is easier to say? And he seems to be baiting them by saying, well, isn't it easier to say your sins are forgiven? Because you can't tell whether they are or not. Or take up your bed and walk. You see, these Jews were very susceptible to completely disdaining and having nothing or not wanting anything about Jesus to be true or right or good. Verse 24, but in order that you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sin. Now let's just stop there for a moment. Son of Man. <clears throat> Why are these things written? That you may believe He is the Son of God. The phrase Son of God shows the deity of Jesus. Son of Man shows the humanity of Jesus. In the book of Daniel chapter 7, along with some other prophecies of the Old Testament, there is the idea of one like to the Son of Man coming up to the Ancient of Days and a kingdom is given to him. Jesus Christ attributes to himself the prophecies of the Old Testament of he himself being the Son of Man. Here in this text, in order that you may know the Son of Man, what is he saying? Me as a human being, I'm going to demonstrate to you that I have authority to forgive sins. What did we also just learn about who can forgive sins? Only God. What is he trying to demonstrate? That he's not just the Son of Man, but he's also the Son of God. All right? So, he says, he said to the paralytic, I say to you. Notice Jesus did not say, by the power of the Father. He did not say, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Could he have said that and been correct? Absolutely. Because just as God created the heavens and the earth, and who is God? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All three are the creator. Which one is acting here to perform this miracle? The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. What's the answer? Yes. Yes. That's who's performing 
this miracle? God is. Well, I say to you, rise. Take up your stretcher and go home. Can you imagine when Jesus said those words? People were going like, The breath had already been taken away. The fact that he said, your sins are forgiven. Now he says, take up your bed and walk. And at once, we might say, immediately. I mean, right now, this fellow gets up, rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on, and went home glorifying God. Now that had to be one of the most awesome things in the world, right? And verse 26 says, and they were all seized up. And they were all seized with astonishment and began glorifying God. And they were filled with fear. It's kind of one of those cry, laugh, stop, frown, then laugh moments where all of your emotions kind of like go one time because you don't know how am I supposed to react to this? What am I supposed to do? Well, I'm going to glorify God. But if, do I, are my glasses working? Is this guy walking? Is he, is he not a paralytic? What in the world has just happened? They were astonished. But notice what else the text says. We have seen remarkable things today. The Matt Mark account says that we have never seen anything like this. Have you? Have you ever witnessed anything like that? These things have been written that you might believe. How can you read that story and believe? Well, we heard the story. I basically read it through twice. Do you believe that story? Do you believe that that story reveals to us just exactly the way the writer said it happened? Do you believe that? Any naysayers? Anybody that don't believe that, raise your hand. Let the record show. Nobody raise their hand. When we read that story, let me ask you a question. Did you see what happened? By the eye of faith, you did. Can you close your eyes and think about that story and see that guy walking off his bed? Can you see that? Those words we just read put a picture in your mind called a word picture. What's the intended purpose of the word picture? That see, you might believe. Believe what? What did Jesus prove that man? Let's think about that just in the remaining moments of our time. I'd like to suggest to us that when we look at this, this great text by John indicates that believing in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, the text says, oh, I didn't realize you can't hardly see that. That's not too good. I, I was trying to be real cool and take a picture of my Bible. <laughs> that, didn't really, that didn't really turn out so great, did it? Okay. And that believing, see the last part of verse 31? And that believing you may have life in his name. That paralytic, what did he walk away with? Well, first of all, he walked away. He was paralytic. He could not walk. There is a sense in which he, Jesus gave him life to his limbs. And he could walk. That must have been awesome. But what else did the paralytic walk away with? Faith. Faith. That's good. He had that faith. It was demonstrated, right? Jesus noticed it as they were letting him down. What else did he 
did he walk away with? He didn't have any sins. Walked away with life. What kind of life? Eternal. Why? Because he would need something. Isn't that a great story? If you're trying to teach somebody to become a Christian, take any one of the miracles, just dissect them like I did. What's he going to do? It's going to demonstrate and show the person that is listening to the eye of faith that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, either the person believes it or they don't. Either they accept it or they don't. Now, the beauty of this great story in thinking about this is that when we consider the idea, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? I don't believe that this miracle was recorded or any of these miracles were recorded, nor was John 20 recorded just for people who are not Christians. I think it's recorded for us that are Christians. Now how might we, who are Christians, make use of this story about what Jesus did? I hope, I hope that all of you that have been parents, that are grandparents, that have ever read books to your children, When you watch the eyes of those little fellows light up, when the story that you are reading, and even if it has little pictures, like I've showed you little pictures, you're looking at the picture, they're looking at the pictures, you're reading the story, and you can see the expressions on their face become, because it, the story becomes real to them. When you read the Bible, you need to allow the words of God to become real in you because it is real. As a child of God, I worship, I serve, I remember every first day of the week the Son of Man, the Son of God, who raised the paralytic and he said to him, your sins are forgiven. Question, how do you know that man's sins were forgiven? Because the same Jesus said, take up your bed and walk, and he did. Is that a lesson for me? Let's look at a few verses. In the book of Matthew... Chapter 1, when Jesus is first introduced to Joseph, one of the things that the angel said to Joseph, the vision, verse 21, about Mary having a son, and she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. Remember that? All right, Ephesians. Chapter 1, Ephesians, chapter 1, <clears throat> verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Question, did the paralytic deserve to be healed? Paralytic deserve to be forgiven. There's no deserves seen in that passage. So what would you call what Jesus did? Grace. What else would you call what Jesus did? Mercy. What did Jesus do? <coughs> Grace, mercy, forgiveness. How do you know he forgave you? Because he raised the very good. Can you see that? With the eye of faith. 
You see, our belief that our sins are forgiven. Do you think that fellow got home? I don't know if he had a lot. I don't know if he had kids. I don't know if he's young enough. The parents still alive. I don't know. But he goes home, right? That says he went home. Now he gets home. Now you imagine he comes home carrying his baby. Then he walks in the front door. Honey, I'm home. You think she's surprised? You think the kids are surprised? You think mom and dad is surprised? You think everybody at home surprised? What else might he say? Oh, by the way, not only am I able to walk, but, but, the same man forgave my sins. Well, honey, how do you know he forgave your sins? Because I couldn't walk and he raised me up and I'm walking. Now I know my sins are forgiven. Do you know your sins are forgiven? Do you know that? Then quit acting like you're still a sinner. Amen. You follow me? Look at the book of 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. I'll be done in about three minutes. That's me first. First John chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now, John is writing to Christians. He's writing to folks when you read the first five verses. He's talking about those that have fellowship with God by walking in the light. But he says, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Who is John talking about? Jesus, the Son of Man. Jesus, the Son of God. Can you believe this? As a child of God, are you going to sin? Now, if you say, no, I don't ever sin, then you're a liar. Do we still need to be forgiven as a Christian? Yes, we make mistakes. When we do such heinous, terrible, haughty, rebellious acts of sin again and again and again, do we get down on ourselves? Do we get discouraged? Do we think, surely God will not forgive me this again for the 14th time? Did Jesus raise the paralytic? Then what will he do for me? He will forgive me. How do I know that? Because he raised the paralytic. That's like, so that's like a, that's the faith of a dog chasing the tail kind of argument. And it is. But just because we illustrated that way does not in any way insinuate that it's not true. I believe that when I sin, Jesus will forgive me. How? By His grace. By His mercy. How do I know that? Because He raised the paralytic. Now I'm just emphasize to you tonight one miracle, one story. Do you need two? Do you need three? Do you need ten stories? How many do we have of what Jesus did? But these things have been written. But you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. God has given us overwhelming evidence that He is the Son of God. And He will forgive you. Do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Either you do or you don't. Well, that's what I come to tell you. That's about all I know about that, that topic, that miracle. I hope you'll study. 
I hope you'll look more at, at what is addressed to us in Scripture about the great deeds that our Savior did for us. Now, I'll put a few of these notes on the board here. This is instruction to those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God, but you've never done anything about it. Jesus Christ himself said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I said? Can you imagine the paralytic laying there on that bed? And Jesus says, Take up your bed and go home. And the paralytic said, I don't think I'm going to do that today. Say what? Take up your bed and go home. And the paralytic says, Well, you know, I don't really. I'm not really convinced that you got to be baptized to be saved. What? Who is he talking to? Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. And while he's laying there arguing with Jesus, he's got to feel, I, I don't know if he felt anything or not, but if you're paralytic and you don't feel anything, wouldn't you start to feel something? I mean, you know, something would come over you, wouldn't it? Something? Well, we talk about all the time about this touchy-feely kind of thing. I mean, Ah, that guy must have had some kind of touchy-feely moment there. Right? Can you imagine this guy saying to Jesus, I don't think so today, Lord. You know, I've got a lot to do. I'm going to go on home. I've got a bad car. You think, well, that's, that's crazy. How much more foolish is it for us to sit here and to know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and that he raised that fellow up, and he walked to his home, and us not do what he asks us to do. Well, this is what Jesus asked him to do. Now you're going to lay it on your bed and act stupid or what? Or are you going to do what Jesus said? How foolish is it of us, dear friend? The devil tries to discourage us and to put us down, to deceive us into thinking that Jesus' grace is limited, that he won't only tolerate so much, and he's done with us. If you confess, as Christians, Turn from your sin. What will he do? He will forgive you. Do you need to be forgiven? Or are you just going to lay down on the bed and be saved? He will forgive you. That fellow went on his way home glorifying God. That's how we read it Acts 8, the end. He went on his way rejoicing. What can you do tonight? You carry your sins out the door, you're going to go home mad and upset and guilty and ashamed. But you can leave the glorifying God. Your choice. Take up your bed and walk. Looking up in any way, once you come to the